Until today, there's already people protesting out in front of Confederation a building. A handful of people outside right now. Uh, not a huge protest, but again, it's people not very happy. And they haven't even heard what today's budget That's is. That's true. They, they were angry before they even got here. So we know that. Uh, we also know the government has been talking a lot about doing more with less. They've unveiled this way forward initiative. Uh, you know, we've seen them reduce the number of managers over the last couple of years. The big question from today's budget is how is that going to trickle down into the core civil service? Because I know a lot of civil servants are wondering, you know, how's this budget going to affect me right. as because they've made it clear that we can't continue to spend the same amount that we have been, so where are those cuts going to come? One of the interesting things about last year's budget, as I'm sure even objective observers would say, is that it was Kathy Bennett's first budget, novice politician, excellent business person, very successful business person, but designing a budget for a province is a lot different than designing a budget for a corporation. I guess one of the things we'll be looking for is, what did Kathy Bennett learn? Yeah, and last budget, in terms of communications, they basically put the budget out there like a big sort of pile of toxic waste and then walked away <laughs> and said, you know, you guys just sort of figure it out. Yeah. And the problem with that is it means that people end up interpreting it for themselves. Special interest groups are able to go in and basically categorize or characterize that budget for you. Right. This time, we already know that the finance minister is booked for the Board of Trade tomorrow, so expect her and other cabinet ministers to really go around the province and explain what's happening here. One of the criticisms of last year's budget is that um, the, the finance minister didn't take a lot of uh, advice from the right people. We'll see if that's happened. I believe that the finance minister has uh, started to speak inside the uh, House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, and, yep, she has. The so there she is. So, all right, Peter, situation. now we can sort of forget the charade and tell you what's actually in the budget. We yeah, so the first thing is the government is going to meet approach. its uh, target of an $800 million deficit this year. That's what they expect it to be at. So government is meeting the targets. And as part of this process, they are doing away with a couple of the most unpopular measures from last year's budget. So remember that gas tax that yep. everyone has been complaining about? Well, starting June 1st, it's going to go down eight and a half cents a liter, which is about half of what it was. And then there's a surprise because there's cut two come December. Right, so in December, there's another couple cents off a liter that people will see at the pumps. So this is, it's going to cost them about $60 million a year in order to roll this back, but I think they're hoping that they'll be able to get some political capital in return for that right. for getting rid of one of the unpopular things. Another unpopular thing from the last budget that's being rolled back, library cuts. That's it was right. a small amount of money, but it led to big headaches for this government, a lot of the protests over this issue, and so they're returning about $650,000 to the library budget. Until they do the review, they're saying they may take it out again, depending right. on what the review finds, but at least for now, it'll allow the libraries to be business as usual. But the levy didn't break. That, no. That is still there. Yeah, that temporary deficit reduction levy is still right. in place, and that was something that they hadn't said would start to be rolled back until about 2018 or so, right. so that's going to still be and there. And another interesting feature that we uh, realized today in the lockup is that they made a lot of money out of oil, much more than we were led to believe. Oh yeah. The reason that they're able to do things like cut the gas tax is because there was a pile of extra oil money. That was that 450 million, something in there? Exactly, it was almost double the amount yeah. of oil Huge royalties amount. that they were expecting thanks to higher oil prices and thanks to oil fields that were producing more oil. So that's given the government a little bit of breathing room here to be able to roll back some of these unpopular things because they have more money to play with and it's allowed them to sort of update their price projections. Now, one interesting thing that I should point out is one of the ways that they were able to meet that deficit of only $800 million, right. which is still a big deficit, was through some accounting changes. So they used, last year, they put in this extra cushion. They said, you know what, oil prices may go down, so we're gonna build in $125 million of cushion. Right. So in case we're wrong, we've got a backup plan. This year, they've removed that cushion, which helps improve their deficit. It me means the deficit isn't quite as big right. as originally planned, but it means if oil prices are lower than expected, they've lost that extra safety net that they have. One other interesting facet of this budget is the finance minister's um, claim this morning, and uh, there's no reason to disbelieve her, but it's in, it's in black and white, that they've cut $283 million in spending. Um, so people who are expecting massive spending cuts are going to be disappointed. And it was very difficult to get a clear number from the minister because she did a news conference, as the minister always does, as to layoffs. Yeah, and that's really the big question out of this because they've said they're cutting $250 million, which is still a lot of money right. even when you're dealing with a government that spends about $8 billion a year. But sh there's no clue as to where those cuts will come from. Right. So. What she made it clear today, no massive job cuts. Uh, they were looking to avoid anything, you know, and again, when you're look, learning from the mistakes of the last budget, it's they didn't want anything that was going to anger unions, especially they're in the middle of negotiations right now. 
Uh, so they've said, yes, we're going to make cuts, but where they're going to be, well, we're not announcing that today. Right. So we're going to have to wait as they do some reviews, and it'll end up being sort of the thousand cuts throughout the year will all of a sudden hear a department's being closed or right. a few people here or there are being laid off. But they've really made an emphasis on trying to do this without affecting frontline services. So we've heard, for example, health, which a lot of people were worried, healthcare is going to cut. Basically cut stays things. the same, right? It pretty much stays the same, and the education too, with the exception of Memorial University. Yeah, they're. The tuition fee freeze is being maintained at Memorial yeah. University, that's a big issue, uh, but Memorial is going to have to figure out how to do that with about $3 million right. so less than their current budget. So Munn takes a $3 million hit, but other than that, and uh, I'm going to say goodbye to Peter in just a moment, it really looks as though most of the measures that you outlined, especially with the gas tax um, and the libraries, uh, and no, last, no massive layoffs, according to the minister, that this is the kind of budget where we want you to like us again. We want to get our popularity back when we were first elected because let's face it, after last year's budget, they had one of the most precipitous declines in popularity in the history of polling. So that could be part of the political motivation behind this budget. Yeah, there's nothing in here as I look through that you could really hold up and say, let's all go rally right. at Confederation Building, I'm angry about this. Right. And compared to the last budget where there were pages and pages and pages mm -hmm. of things. So in many ways, they're trying to make this sort of a boring budget right. in order to try and get away from anything that might hurt their popularity because you know, Dwight Ball, the second least popular premier yeah. in the province right now, right. they're hoping that this budget will help fix that. All right, Peter Cowan, thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's the CBC's Peter Cowan. Of course, you can catch more of him tonight on Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. You are listening and watching a live special, Budget 2017 from the Confederation Building. We're going to go through other facets of the budget. You heard Peter mention at the beginning, the government made a pile of money, some of it unexpected, or at least the sheer amount. Uh, Terry Roberts has been following that story, and he'll be filing on that uh, for Here and Now as well. Terry, what do we make of the oil in this budget? Well, Anthony, I think it's fair to say, once again, we've been bailed out by oil. Uh, we went into, you remember last year when Kathy Bennett delivered her first budget? The forecast at the time was for oil revenues of $500 million uh, for the past fiscal year. Well, guess what? It almost doubled. We came in at 900 and, uh, $962 million. That's right. almost a, a quarter billion dollar windfall that they weren't expecting. And I guess the significance of that, Terry, is that that windfall allows Kathy Bennett and Dwight Ball's Liberal government to do some of the things that Peter was mentioning. So that means being able to put money back into libraries, uh, apparently not having to lay off people, although we'll get into the layoffs a little bit later and what it actually means to say there are no massive layoffs. In her speech, she's actually going to mention uh, legislating a wage freeze, so that, that's not over. But again, the oil really gets, gives them a chance to do some stuff, a lot of stuff that's much more positive than Kathy Bennett's first budget. We're, right, we're nowhere where we used to be. Remember we were at uh, you know $2.8 billion a year that's what we were getting in royalties about a decade ago. We're nowhere near that, but there's still hopes that the, the, those royalty numbers are going to stay consistent now for the next few years. We're expecting another $900 million in royalties for the upcoming fiscal year. Again, that's money that we hadn't really forecasted. Why is that, Anthony? Well, the price. We've seen the price of oil go up. They've uh, set their budget last year based on a, 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 an average price for Brent crude of $40. Right. So they've well, been guess, very, very cautious. Well, guess what it ended up at? The average uh, average price was about $52, right. and right now it's at $55. So that's tens of millions of dollars every time it goes up, even a buck for uh, for this province. And you got to things are working well right now offshore. Our three producing oil fields are doing well. They produced uh, several million dollars, several million barrels more last year right. than they, uh, they they had expected, which was really good news. And there's. We're going, to talk, we're going to talk about another energy uh, part of the budget, and that's Muskrat Falls, because it's fascinating. One of the things that Kathy Bennett says is that they don't want to see our electricity rates uh, double, and so there's measures for Nalcor. Nalcor has been directed to... Well, uh, if, you know, if you know what's happening with Muskrat Falls, that, uh, you know, that massive over-budget, over, uh, you know, behind-schedule project, uh, we're going to have to pay for that uh, starting in a few years' time, when that comes online. Right. So, you know, people like Stan Marshall, the new CEO of Nalcor, he said that our power rates could conceivably double when Muskrat Falls power starts flowing into our homes. Right. Well, he's been given his marching orders by Premier Dwight Ball. Don't let that happen. Mitigate that as much as you can. So the province, not only are we dealing with a spending problem, they're also making sure that curtailing those, uh, uh, those rises in, in, in electric, electricity rates yep. will also be offset. So they're putting away, in the next few years, 
up to a couple hundred million dollars. Yeah, that, help cushion the blow. That's right. Uh, Nalcor has basically been ordered to quote source about a quarter of a billion dollars, uh, starting in a particular. I think it's when it comes online or just before, and to uh, actually find 250 million every subsequent year to somehow mitigate, as you put it, uh, our electricity costs. So I think there's some surprise about that. Exactly what it means and who pays for that? Where does Nalcor get that quarter of a billion dollars? Well, that's still, a, still an open question, but we know one way they're going to get some money. We're going to pay for it. We're going to pay for it. Because there's, big, there's a big thing going to happen next summer. In the middle of next summer, we're going to start getting Labrador power right here on the island of Newfoundland for the first time. Right. That's because that uh, new uh, Labrador interconnected the grid, link. Yep. the link, is going to be finished, going right. right to Churchill Falls. That's been up there uh, you know, pumping out thousands of megawatts of power for 40 odd years. Right. Now we're going to have uh, we're going to be able to plug in right here in St. John's, wherever you are in Newfoundland, and get power from Labrador next year. That's going to displace thousands of high-cost crude that we're using right now to produce thermal energy at Holyrood. That's going to save about 100, 160 million dollars a year right there, says Stan Marshall. Now one of the ironies in this budget, and I'll end uh, I'll end with Terry on this, and that is that we've heard before that the Newfoundland and Labrador economy has to diversify. But one of the lessons and one of the surprises in this budget is that this government is just as dependent on oil as previous governments. And they've been critical about that fact. It looks as though diversification, you can talk it, you know, tourism, the fishery and those things, but oil is still king. Right, well, uh, Kathy Bennett did say today, she stressed that we still have a serious spending problem. And she said, we need a government in Newfoundland and Labrador that governs based on not on the price of oil or what we might get from oil, but what the reality is in this province. Right. Terry Roberts, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's the CBC's Terry Roberts. I'm Anthony Germain, and you are watching a live budget special, Budget 2017, here in the lobby of the Confederation Building. Of course, many dozens and dozens of reporters have been uh, locked up all day to actually study and pour over the budget documents. I mentioned at the top of our special something different that we haven't done before. We've got Charter Professional Accountant uh, Larry Short with us. Of course, uh, Larry has been on uh, CBC Radio before, and he's our analyst this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. Uh, Larry, very interesting document in many respects. I want, I want to pick up on what Terry was saying about oil and, and discuss that with, with you for a few minutes because obviously Kathy Benefit, uh, Kathy Benefit, she has benefited, Kathy Bennett has benefited from uh, the oil that Terry yes. was talking about yeah. and it's taken her a long way to do some of the things that she's doing today. Yes. You heard Terry talk about how good it is that, you know, as oil progresses, but that's of course on the assumption that oil is going to rise. Yes, and uh, quite frankly, one of the reasons that we as a province got into the trouble that we got into in the past was that we became highly dependent on oil as being the key provider of uh, certainly the marginal revenue. So when uh, the price of oil plunged down to $26 a barrel in uh, 2016, uh, okay. um, that we saw, uh, but along the way, as we saw prices dive. move down yeah. uh, through 2015, uh, 14, 15, and then the 16. Uh, we saw the, the revenue dry up, uh, although the commitments are, had already been made for expenses and um, continued to be made. So it really comes down to uh, how accurate that oil forecast is. Um, what is also surprising is the, in the budget is the fact that they have taken away that $125 million, essentially, the cost that they put in to say, what if we're ro wrong on oil prices? Right, and what Larry's talking about there is an emergency cushion that was there Let's say we predict oil at $54 a barrel and turns out that oil comes in at 48. That 120 million was there, it would be there to protect you. Now for the next year, that's gone, right? That's right. So let's just unwrap you know, the whole assumption process yep. that was with, uh, with oil. Because if you, if you look back as to um, 2014, the thought was that oil prices would be stay the same. Uh, the vast majority of forecasts, the consensus was somewhere around $100 a barrel. Right. Um, and that's and really what got us into this mess. That's got us into this mess. So what happened that was different? What was different in 2014 that was not different before was American uh, frackers. These are companies in the United States that developed the technology to go into um, uh, shale formations um, and extract oil that otherwise would not flow. Right. So this was a, uh, a technological revolution uh, primarily focused through, uh, the, the, uh, through the United States of America, although there are similar shale found, uh, formations throughout the world in certain areas, the technology itself hasn't really been exported much. So what happened was uh, through the process of fracking, the Americans were able to produce much more oil than, that, than was expected. Right. So how is that relevant to today in this budget? Because the frackers are coming back. So back then, the thought was uh, uh, the Saudis in particular, but 
Mideast oil was losing the Americans um, as being their customers. Right. And, uh, and as a reaction, they, they, instead of trying to compete with them price by price, they said, we're going to have a price war with the Americans and we're going to knock the price of oil down dramatically to try to put these fracking companies out of business. And to a large extent, it did work initially. It, that is, when they knocked the price down below $65 a barrel, which was the average cost of production of a fracking well, right. uh, they were able to do that and, and uh, put a lot of these companies out of business. Those companies have gone through restructuring, and in many cases, they're coming back in business at a lower cost. And then so, there's President Trump. Right, so, so the thought then, through 2016, was that if Clinton became president, she was going to put in environmental controls on fracking, because it is still very controversial, it's a new emerging industry. Doesn't she lost the election. She lost the election, she lost the election, and Trump came in, not only did he not put in new environmental controls. But he's basically telling frackers, give her. That's it, produce and like coal. crazy. Well, coal, I'm not so much worried about, it is, it, so ironically, yes, coal, he's, he's taken the rules off, but nobody wants to buy coal. But oil, yes. So, so there is a risk that the American frackers could, at least in the short run, drive down the price of oil again the same way as they did before. How much? It could, uh, their cost of production now has dropped from an average of about $65 a barrel to the low 20s. So they can well, still make money. Well, the 20s would put us back in some of the crisis situation that exactly. we were in before, right? Right. Now, long term, longer term, um, because of the cheap uh, price of oil, relative cheap pr price of oil, um, major projects around the world have been halted. Right. So you can see out in, in five, seven years that the price of oil will recover simply because the fracking uh, okay. supply is not there as, as strongly. All right, that's Larry Short. Larry Short is our analyst on our CBC Budget 2017 election special, election special, budget special, elections coming in a couple of years. They did mention, by the way, once again, that they intend to actually get back in surplus the year after the next election. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the monetary issues. The debt has increased by almost a billion dollars. I'm going to talk to Larry about that in, uh, in just a bit. Also, if you've got questions for Larry, and it could be about any aspect of the budget that you're reading online on our website, cbc.ca slash nl, or that you're hearing or watching in this special, you can actually go to our Facebook page, watch this special, and uh, in the comments section, if you've got a question for Larry or a comment, you can put that in there, and uh, the CBC's Ariana Kellen will actually come and join us, as she's doing right now, to actually share your questions, and uh, Larry will try to answer them as best he can. So go to our Facebook page, put your question in there, and uh, we'll get that answer to you. Now, Ariana joins us uh, to get through some of the other things that are in the budget that we haven't managed to get to. So where do you want to start? Yeah, so, okay, well, let's start with, because we actually have a question right off the top. So as you mentioned, we are taking questions right now on our Facebook page, and we have a question. I'm hoping that one of you guys will be able to answer it. Uh, Jody asks, when should we expect to hear how the rating agencies respond yeah. to the budget? And I know that this was asked in the budget. This, is, this is an excellent question because yeah. Kathy Bennett made history today. She actually got in touch with New York, and people who don't live in Newfoundland found out about our uh, financial situation before anybody in Newfoundland did. Larry, this was this was an incredible moment actually yes. during, the, so during the budget lockdown. Yeah, so it shows um, that she does take this uh, problem very, very seriously, and uh, it is the first time that uh, this has been done. So obviously, uh, it, th these people were were. Um, required to keep uh, the budget details secret. This is not essentially this essentially yeah. just to be clear for people who are watching listening to the special what Kathy Bennett did and this is the first she gave embargoed copies to uh, I gather Moody's and other rating agencies to yeah. say this is my plan and I think as Larry's pointing out that in itself is an indication as to possibly the concern about what would happen to our credit rating. Exactly. So uh, and for those who are not aware our credit rating is pretty low. So it's down to the point where one or two downgrades from here would cause a dramatic increase in the cost of borrowing, and in fact may shut off some uh, potential uh, borrowers from being allowed to uh, to lend money to us. Um, so that starts to get pretty good. close to a Greece situation, doesn't it? Yes, um, exactly, because if indeed uh, we do violate um, the amount of that we have promised to borrow, if something if we get an external shock that means we have to borrow more money or revenue drops, et cetera, price of oil falls, uh, et cetera, then it could put us in a situation where we would be subject to a further downgrade, and a further downgrade would cause an increase in cost of borrowing, right. and potentially, in some cases, shutting down certain certain lenders from from lending to us, and that is would exacerbate our situation considerably. And part of the significance of that is that in through the next few years, this government still has to borrow uh, to maintain services at the level they are. Well, in, in uh, so just to be clear here, uh, two things. One is, 
um, we are always in the process of borrowing because bonds are coming due that we let out years ago, so we had to replace that. Yeah. And then on top of that, in this particular case, we're borrowing a, a roughly another 900 million, it's around the two a billion, just yeah. for fun, billion dollars on top of that. So that's kind of piece of one. Just to answer, to be sure we answered the question, um, the preliminary feedback from the uh, phone call that uh, the minister had with the rating agencies is that everything looks good, um, so they, ha they have not reported back, but we do have to wait for the formal report coming back from the rating agencies in the event that there is a, a change in opinion. All right. So Jody, I hope that answers your question. If you've got questions for us, uh, please send them. Ariana's checking our Facebook page. Uh, we're on Facebook Live right now. You can watch us and just put your questions uh, into the comments section. All right, now, what do you what do you like to bring attention yeah, to that was so in this budget? Last year, as you know, it was the pocketbook. Everyone was talking about it's going to cost more to live, to die everything in the middle. Right. But when you look through the budget, there's not a whole lot there. There are a couple of little nuggets, but they're kind of bonuses. So for instance, they're starting a new program. I think it's five to four million that they're going to put in for um, low to middle income earners to renovate their houses. That means adding insulation, uh, making sure home heating costs are low. Uh, they added some more money to the uh, child daycare subsidy, two million dollars going in also for low income earners. And they've also kept that payment there for low income seniors. So they haven't really taken that much away that we know of right. yet and it wasn't like last year where we had fee hikes tax increases right across the board um, also we're seeing a lot of the same things that we've been seeing year over year over year in the budget a lot of uh, a lot of re-announcements which a is of course of one of the things that yeah. modern governments do they announced things months ago put them back in the budget so they appear like a good sort of generous yeah. bit of investment exactly. and uh, and really it's stuff that we already knew about. Yeah, so we know uh, Her Majesty's Penitentiary, $100,000, of course, that part of that building dates back to the 1800s. That's not a new you know, investment. And $100,000, so. that's a far cry from an election campaign promise to it's a replace it. Right? Exactly, so you'll see that HMP is in there. There's some money for the Waterford, but not to replace it. This is the planning stages, uh, money for the Cornerbrook Hospital again, something that right. was announced over and over again. Um, also, uh, a new courthouse for St. John that was announced previously. Right. This is just, uh, I believe, $500,000 to go towards, again, the planning stages. For a study of what they called a complex of courthouses for St. John's, so we'll see what happens with that study. I'm Anthony Germain. You're watching a live special or listening to us on CBC Radio 1, 88.5 here in FM or 640 AM. Good to have you along. But Larry Short is with me uh, all afternoon for this. We're going to stay on the air on radio until 3 o'clock. And depending on how things go, we might stay on Facebook Live uh, a little longer than that. And if you've got a question, as I say again, go to our Facebook page, put your question there in the comments section. Yeah, and we have even more questions coming in. Uh, Jocelyn asks, what was said about the Muskrat Falls project? Muskrat Falls, very interesting stuff. There wasn't anything specific uh, brought in as, as any new uh, one-line costs and, and the like. Did you see Well, I guess the, the significant thing is that Kathy Bennett, very early in her speech uh, this afternoon, said that it is not their vision to see people pay double the electricity rates and they've come up with a multi-million dollar scheme in which they have directed, they've ordered Nalcor to, as we said at the beginning of this special, source $250 million to at least try to bring down that doubling of rates. How that's going to work, where Nalcor is going to, quote, source that money from, it could be us paying Nalcor, they'll bank that and then they'll give us a rebate later on. We don't really know the details of that, but to the extent that uh, Muskrat Falls was yeah. mentioned, that's the big ticket. Yeah, there was no, there was no uh, discussion about what everybody was worried about which was, was there an increased cost? There was, there, was right. no, there was no discussion of that whatsoever. Whatsoever, that's true. All right, Ariana? Yeah, so we have more questions coming in. Again, if you're just tuning in, go to our Facebook page, right in the comments section of this video, put in your question, we'll try to get to them. But of course, lots and lots of questions. And we do have another one if you guys have I think time. we'll come back to that in just yeah. a minute, if that's okay. So keep those questions coming, we'll try to get to them. And as I mentioned, we may extend the Facebook Live special, depending on the number of questions we get. Now, one of the important sections, and this is a biggie, has to do with the public pensions and the public service. We've got Jerry Earl is actually standing by right here. I'll invite Mr. Earl to come uh, to come join us right now. How are you doing? Uh, Jerry Earl, good to see you. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure. One of the things that Kathy Bennett said in a lockup is that there will be no massive layoffs. Do you believe her? Uh, and again, the devil's in the details sometimes. It's one thing that we've seen here is they talk about agency boards and commissions having to come up with eight point eight point nine million dollars billion uh, or mo million million right so when you and that's excluding health care and education so if yep. you look at the remaining agency boards and commissions uh, the question that we still have the devil's in the details does that mean job reductions in those areas 
Uh, I think they learned from last year. They made an announcement right in the budget of uh, massive layoffs that caused all kinds of problems. Uh, and they've clearly not done it in this budget. So there's a number of people out there today right. uh, breathing a sigh of relief on that. But we still will have follow-up questions, specifically in that area. Uh, what does it mean in those areas? But just because she hasn't been specific in this budget and given you a sort of number, absolutely, uh, does that necessarily rule out that we could see layoffs or not? Now she says we won't see massive layoffs, but my idea of massive, your idea of massive, Kathy Bennett's idea of massive, what's yeah, massive? Absolutely, and, th and that's the question we have, because again, uh, if you look at their way forward document, which is not talked about in this budget so much, they're talking about again in the health care, regional health authorities, uh, how they expend to see certain services consolidate. Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean to be less employees working those services? So they haven't addressed that in this budget, right. but in their way forward, they give indications of those areas. So obviously that's something we're going to pay uh, close attention to. And using wording, we always read between the lines. She's using the word, there won't be massive layoffs. Right. So again, I sit back and say, are there still going to be layoffs? And what kind of numbers? In, in terms of her budget speech, one of the important references in there is that uh, she will actually uh, possibly uh, institute a wage freeze, right? What's your sense of that and how would that work? Again, with respect to the minister, she has to realize we're at the bargaining table. Yeah. Uh, making those type of comments again makes bargaining, it's already made bargaining diff difficult well, what's happening. On, on the one hand, weeks, the minister says she doesn't want to negotiate in public and then yet her budget speech actually contains that kind of line. Is that sort of a, all right, Mr. Earl, I want to get your attention. Yeah, and she can try to use that line as much as she wants and I used the term before, NAEP and specifically and other labor movements are not going to be intimidated by any government or any minister. We are going to go to the bargaining and we're actually at the bargaining table today, ironically enough, as this uh, budget comes down, uh, in conciliation uh, that the minister requested. So we will leave those discussions there uh, and we'll bargain fairly. Okay. But again, those messages in there and those comments uh, we find offensive. Again, we'll collect the bargains taking place. And yet overall, you say there's a sigh of relief. So I, I'm sure many people out there, but again, when you look at this budget, and people are going to be a sigh of relief because they're looking at last year's budget as the yardstick. Right. That's a terrible yardstick to look at because last year's budget, you probably couldn't get any worse. Right. So to compare it to last year's budget, uh, yeah, people will probably get a sigh of relief, but there's m many things in this budget that does not address the damage that's already been done right. to young people, to communities, to health care already from just last year's budget. Just a question about politics for you, then I'll let you go, because I know uh, many, many other people and journalists want to talk to Jerry Earl, because a lot of people care about the public service and how this budget is going to affect them. The politics of this, doesn't it seem to you that it's the same old story, uh, the sky is falling, we're going to have layoffs, it's going to be horrible, and then, oh, I made that so very bad. comment uh, probably an hour ago, Anthony, in our locking room. Uh, unfortunately, we got to stop playing politics with people's lives that, like say, almost like the sky is falling, and then come with a budget and say it wasn't so bad. Right. Because it adds, and adds, and this adding an adverse effect of our members, we've done polling of our own members, we had people that were secure. Right. That we're not spending money in the economy because comments that were out there, just as you said, the sky was falling basically. All right, appreciate your time and uh, good luck going pleasure. forward. Thank you very much. All right, that's Jerry Earl, the head of NAEP. You're watching and listening to a live special, Budget 2017, from the lobby of uh, the House of Assembly. I'm Anthony Germain, here with our CBC News team and our analyst, a chartered professional accountant, uh, Larry Short, with Hollis Wealth. And Larry, I want to shift the discussion a little bit. Uh, you heard what Mr. Earl had to say. One of the key questions that we were talking about inside the lockup has to do with the level of debt mm -hmm. and pensions. Yes. Let's chew over that and explain to people just how much the pensions are costing. Right, so let's just, let's just uh, round numbers again, uh, because these are big numbers. So $15 billion is the net debt that the province owes so that hole just got about a billion dollars deeper. About a billion dollars bigger. So yeah. we're still still going, the, the credit card is still maxed out in debt. Which might explain why Kathy Bennett decided to give the, bo the bond rating agencies a heads call, up, right? A heads up and say, hey, here's what we're doing, how you feel about that. So that's one point. But, but if you dig into the tables, you see that approximately 10 billion out of that 15 billion is actually owed uh, to the pension funds of the province of Newfoundland. So I really want to be clear about this. Yeah, so one of the problems is, you know, Larry, we've discussed, particularly for radio listeners, it's difficult to understand the enormity of those numbers. So how many dollars in, in that gigantic hole, yeah. how many of those dollars are owed to the workers? Out of $100 that's owed, $66, roughly. Of the debt. Of the debt is owed to the pension funds. So what does that mean for that, people expecting a pension? That means that if, uh, if I were, hmm, here's, how to, how to put it in, in uh, simplest terms is that um, one has to be very careful 
one has to be addressing the government not just on the basis of being a NAEP employee or an employee, but the fact that they are the steward, the government is the steward of their, their very pension. So one of the uh, factors that one can uh, take is that I, you know, we as uh, citizens of the province do not want the government to cut back on expenses and, and spending, but on the other hand, uh, how is that $10 billion going to be paid out when 10, 15, 20 years hence when people who are in their 40s and 50s are going to be looking for uh, pension income? So, so just to be clear, so let's say I'm a, I'm a civil servant of some kind, I'm a public employee, and I'm listening to what we're saying right now, and two of every three of those dollars, two yes. thirds of the money is owed money. to those workers. So if I'm, in, if I'm working in the government right now as a, as a public servant, um, and I'm 25, 30, 35, yeah. should I be concerned that, wait a second, this job that I got, I was thinking, hey, I've got it made. Right. I'm going to be one of those guys or gals who's going to get one of these pensions at the end. Yeah. How do I know, given those numbers, that that pension's actually going to be there for me? You don't. That's the key part. If I were an, if I were an employee of the, of the provincial government, I would make sure that the lights were turned off every single night when I go out that door. I would be looking at every single pen and paper clip and every single piece of paper because this, the amount that's owed is not to some distant group out there, it's owed to the actual pension plans themselves. All right, uh, we're going to continue our discussion about the contents and details of Budget 2017. I'm Anthony Germain. We're going to go to Ariana Kellen now. We've been telling you, if you've got a question about the budget, something you want answered, we'd love for you, if you're watching on Facebook Live, and if you're not, go to the Facebook page, put your question in there, and Larry will try to do his best to answer it. Ariana? Yeah, so we have lots of questions coming in. This one from Ryan Woodford. He asks, does the budget have any proactive job-creating measures? Job creating measures, you could not see. dramatic. I mean, there was a couple of some infrastructure yeah, uh, some announcements, but that's, those are re-announcements. Yeah, right? and they're, re they're really at the margin. Not enough that is, uh, is going to make a significant difference uh, to the province. So it, it, it's, it, you won't see it. The easiest way to explain it is that there was a few dollars put into it, but it's not a dramatic amount. I mean, politically, th there may be statements about here's, here's where our efforts are, are, are going, but it's not something that's going to hit the bottom line in any significant fashion. Right, we have a couple of other questions too. Sure. Some questions coming in about education. Now there were a couple of nuggets, um, especially about inclusive education, which has come up uh, numerous times in our right. Inside the Classroom That's special. Yep. Um, so one of the things that they are doing, uh, they're giving I think is $500,000 right. towards upping the number of teacher assistants that help in these inclusive classrooms. So that is one uh, measure that they're doing um, in terms of other education. There was also some talk of secondary education too, which you could probably Right, there, so there was a half a million dollars, which is at least something towards uh, the inclusive education model in Newfoundland Labrador that will hire uh, teaching assistants who are a vital part of making sure that all children, regardless of uh, their disability, uh, actually get to be part of the system. So that is there. But overall, as we are saying earlier, uh, when it comes to it being a healthcare budget or an education yeah. budget, it, it isn't really. Uh, what they made clear in the lockup was that as far as education and health go, it's stay the course, spending will remain the same, but the trick for that, Larry, mm. How do you keep spending the same over the next four or five years, given yeah. inflation yeah. and given the rising costs of uh, just about everything? Well, it, it's actually a little bit worse than that. I mean, the fact of the matter is that it's ballpark $8 billion is being spent, and, eight, and there are no pl plans specifically to drop that down to, say, five or four and a half billion dollars. It is, um, a, a, the, the projections that are currently showing is still showing around that $8 billion, and again, you know, one can say, well, we're going to decrease it by 40 million here, 30 million here, but again, that's nuggets, I think was right. a really nice okay. word that was used. So over time, we have to recognize that there is a fundamental structural problem here, which is that the, the government, per se, is spending too much. Right. Um, uh, and, and we can address that when we get into the discussion about the um, equalization. All right, and um, we are going to talk about equalization at the end because that certainly came up and Kathy Bennett uh, has either mentioned that in her speech or she's about to with respect to whether or not this province can count on Ottawa uh, helping us out with equalization. There is very little evidence that they can, but we'll get into the details in just a bit. Want to stay with education. We've got Reagan Burden with us. Hello and thank you for coming. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. So what, what's your analysis of what this budget does for education, particularly at the higher education levels? Well, I'm really excited to see that there won't be uh, an increase in tuition for post-secondary students. It's a really good thing. Um, myself, I live off campus, and when cuts were made to MUN last year, I know that they increased the residence rate, which right. was a problem for a lot of people. Um, so, it, you know, MUN still needs to make money. There's a lot of problems with infrastructure at mm -hmm. MUN. You know, people are saying that we need better teachers, that we need more resources for students on campus. Um, 
especially surrounding mental health. Something's happened recently in Guelph University. They had a huge tragedy there. We've had a couple suicides at MUN in the past couple years. So I think there are a lot of resources that we still need to right. have at MUN, but without these tuition increases, I'm really curious to see how we're going to get the money to have them there. Right, and there was the re-announcement in this budget of additional funding for mental health, but again, that was something that had already been made public through the insistence of the federal government trying to basically uh, control some of the provincial expenditures to make sure that additional funds would go to mental health. How much of that will be dedicated to university students and young people? I'm not sure because I, I might ask you to wear your hat as a young person. Yeah. And that yep. is, it doesn't strike me as though there's very much in this budget for young people. Yeah, it really seems that way. And I think one of the things that the government hasn't considered with this budget is what post-secondary students are going to do once they get their education. Right. For me, coming to MUN for post-secondary was a no-brainer. It's close to home. Tuition was really affordable. Um, I was involved with provincial organizations that I had friends here in St. John's. But right now, when I look at this budget and I look at the fiscal situation of our province, mm -hmm. once I get my post-secondary education, I don't see any reason to stay here in Newfoundland other than being close to family and the fact that this is where I was raised. But I know that I can make a home somewhere else. You know, I all have skills that are applicable for other places. And right now, myself and for a lot of my friends who are students, we don't really have a reason to stay in Newfoundland right now. And I think the government really needs to provide us with one. If you know, one of the problems isn't that, isn't that tremendously ironic though that on the one hand we're subsidizing your education, keeping the tuition freeze, and yet what you're telling me right now is that once you graduate as a successful student, if you're going to go on to other studies or look for employment, you're out of here. I it it sucks. I love Newfoundland and I would love to stay here. Uh, I'm from Labrador, so you know I feel far away enough from home uh, being in St. John's sometimes, right. but. I just don't know if there are opportunities for me here right now. Um, you know, we're seeing. Um, you What's seen your any field of study? I'm teaching political science and communication studies. Okay. Um, and I actually have seen a few communication jobs come up in the St. John's area on Kijiji when I've been looking for jobs. But you know, right now it's hard enough to get a job serving in the city because the economy is so bad. People yeah. are getting part-time jobs to go along with their full-time jobs and. I don't know. It seems like we're in a dire situation right now, and I want to stay in Newfoundland, but I just don't know if there's going to be an opportunity for me to be here. So let me ask you one challenging question. Uh, again, Memorial University is looking at a $3 million reduction, not as severe as last year, where I think it was $20 million was what they were looking at. And um, Kathy Bennett has basically said in her speech, and she told us there will be no rise in tuition. You favor that. As I'm sure you know, Reagan, a lot of people think that MUN is on borrowed time, already the lowest tuition in the country. Why should the tuition freeze stay in place? Personally, I think that you want to attract people here to Newfoundland. One of the huge problems that we have is we have an aging population. We have a population that's decreasing, and people say that to help with our economy, we need to get people back here. We need to get people working, buying here, and contributing to the economy. And if you don't have people from across Canada and in Newfoundland staying here for school, yeah. I think there's an even smaller chance that they would stay here after finishing their post-secondary or come back here. Okay, but uh, just to be the devil's advocate, and I'll leave on this, what if we would actually allow a tuition increase and take the funds from that to craft some kind of retention strategy so that young people get jobs? That's like a that's a good question. Um, I'm not. That's really what they pay me for. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, I'm not really sure to be honest. Um, living in the province is really expensive right yeah. now, you, especially with you know um, hydro bills are going to go up, electricity bills are going to go up. Um, buying groceries here isn't very cheap, and Everything. if you're a student expensive. and you're True. living off campus, those are things that you have to okay. do. Well, Reagan, thank you very much for coming on the show, and our special. I appreciate thank that, and good me. luck. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, that's Reagan Burden. I'm Anthony Germain. You're watching and listening to a CBC special, Budget 2017, from the lobby of the House of Assembly. We're going to get to another question from Mariana Kellen in just a moment. First, Larry, I want to ask you about the tuition freeze. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people, and speaking as a parent who actually has paid tuition and is yes. paying tuition, it's it's remarkably inexpensive. And right. on the one hand, the government is doing what it did last year, saying, sorry, Mun, we're taking money away, and oh, Mun, you can't raise it, you can't raise tuition. Right, so it, it is kind of ironic in the fact that, uh, as this uh, young lady was just saying, that uh, here we are uh, educating some of the brightest minds in the country and not providing an opportunity for them to stay within the province. So part of this really gets back to the culture um, of uh, the business culture here. So if, if and, and, and again, part of it gets into not just the provincial government, not just the federal government, but the municipal government. The fact is that in order to create an environment that spawns businesses, that causes business from overseas to want to come here, from central Canada to come here, you have to change the climate here. And the climate here has, to a large extent, um, been ruled by a tremendous number of rules and regulations. I want to give you one uh, sure. just simple example, and this one, um, 
uh, I might have to, uh, to move out of the province after this one, but just you consider <laughs> that the, that within the province of Newfoundland, the two largest cities have mayors nine kilometers apart. So, uh, so here you have a, a business that wishes to locate in the area. They have to deal with one set of rules and regulations and planning department for St. John's, another one for Mount Pearl. Right. And then you go a little bit further and you got another series of them. That doesn't exist anywhere else. Th there would be one city that would take th the whole area. But I know that in talking with- Politically, there's no will. There's not, no, there's not, right. there's not necessarily a will. There's not, an, uh, any politician that talks, there's a couple of words that a politician in the province are never allowed to say. One of them is amalgamation. Cannot say it. So the idea- It doesn't matter if you're a red guy or a blue guy or orange guy. It does not matter right? what color. For someone to suggest that the city of Mount Pearl would be folded into John's, which is completely surrounds it, right. uh, would be political suicide for anybody to do so. But if you are saying, how do we create a business environment that will attract other businesses? You've got to flatten the playing field and reduce the rules and, uh, and, and regulations, increase, uh, shorten the time with which businesses can actually get uh, business done here. All right, so there's an argument in favor of amalgamation. Uh, I hope that uh, Randy Sims and Doc O'Keefe are watching this special, because I think what they try to talk about most of the time is there's always room for regional cooperation, as right. opposed to going the full Monty, yeah. which is a marriage between right. all those communities. Yes. When are you running for office? Never. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll get back to Larry Short, but first we're going to, and we might get back to Larry Short very quickly, because Ariana has another question. Yeah, so now the conversation around Facebook, and we're getting a lot of really great questions, uh, but we're talking about debt, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think net debt, 15.2 billion. billion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so question from Dwayne, how can the debt increase after the budget cuts from last year? Uh, because the spending that was that was already occurring, that was already committed, that was already um, that was already in process in the pipeline, contracts that have been let it, et cetera, um, continued on. And, uh, and and again, you know, I I've, I've, I've talked about the the, the uh, viewing this the, the province is a, is a big shift, let's get everybody get to shore and then uh, we can figure out what to do. It takes a long time to turn a big ship like this. So just sim simply because of the commitments that have already been made, the debts are continuing. Right, and I guess in terms of actually balancing that spending, if that's the sort of the nature of the question, at least with the deficit, uh, she, Kathy Bennett is claiming that they will be in a surplus situation in seven years. In seven think, years, right? yes. Five, five years, the year after the next election. Uh, sorry. Uh, which is yes. politically convenient. Yes, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the it, year I, after we get elected, we'll be in surplus. Right. And it looks as though when you look at her graphs and charts, right. they could do that. But, but again, so get back you, to oil. You still, you, still, you still have, though, a statement that it's still going to be $8 billion. It's still going to be $8 billion worth of expenses. Yeah. That, that is the expenditure. And there's no clear statement to say that there's an effort going to be made to reduce that. Now, that could be tactical decision because uh, quite frankly the government is in um, negotiations with the unions right so do you really say that and then, that and then the other element to it is uh, we're also going into a economy that's shrinking so the government is supposed to be supporting the economy in times that the economy down turns right. down so do you really want to have a statement to say you're going to be cutting expenditures when the economy is falling if we do get some sort of a further windfall and oil prices actually rise right. or um, iron ore prices rise or uh, nickel, copper, zinc, that sort of thing, and we do get a boost, yeah. that may be the time to talk, and that should be the time when the government comes out and says, the economy's doing great, we're, we're going to cut back on hiring, yeah. and we're going to cut back on spending. That's okay. the way it's supposed to work. One of the interesting things, I had a chance to sort of briefly check uh, my Twitter feed, and one of the things that a lot of people are talking about, and this is no surprise, even though you know all the numbers, is the uh, cut to the gas tax. We're going to go to another question, Darian, yeah. in just a moment. But what's interesting is that since they basically said we're going to cut part of it this June, part of it in December, so it's going to come down by basically three quarters of what they stuck in last year, right? We're yeah. looking around 12 cents, something like that, a reduction right. from 16. We asked Kathy Bennett how much it would cost. She said that's going to cost us $60 million. What do you make of the fact that they, they got hammered last year when they brought in this tax? They were making $60 million of it. They still need the money. Yeah. Why get rid of it? Uh, and that's the exact question. This doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I mean, they were scorched for this. Right. They paid the political price. Paid, right? Yes, but that, that that gets into away from the economic side and into the political side. Right. Economically, they should not have cut that that tax. We need the money. Yeah. We still need it. We're still running a deficit, and we will continue to run a, a deficit. Uh, so cutting that after after the scar tissue that they now are walking around with yeah. after after the lashing last year, yeah. I don't know why they. And do nobody that. knows about the pain of those cuts or the scar tissue that Larry mentions more than Kathy Bennett. I'm uh, going to get to the question in a minute, but my reason for actually posing that question to you was when you take a look at the money that they could, $60 million, there was a graph inside uh, some of the budget documents that shows 
where they're spending cuts. And I, I'm going to try to do on television, I'll give you a hand graph uh, for those of you who are watching. I mean, it really look kind of like this, Larry, didn't it? Right, sort of a slow reduction yeah. in spending. Yes. Uh, you made some interesting comments about the level of reduction in spending, and I wonder if uh, the business, banks, or, to, or New York, right. will they be satisfied with the pattern of spending reduction that Kathy Bennett has laid out. Well, that, and that's uh, part and parcel of why there's now apparently an investor relations uh, person who is in charge of making sure that the creditors are made aware of any changes that are, are, are arising. And this is new. This is not something that we've heard about before. It is, is a, 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 um, an individual who is responsible to uh, brief the lenders to make sure that they're aware of any uh, changes or any potentially dramatic changes. So, so again, we, we get back to, is this uh, what should continue in the long run? Because, uh, again, it, if, as the minister has stated, we have a spending problem, not yeah. necessarily a revenue problem. The revenue uh, is staying relatively the same. We get a bit of a bonus uh, here now and then, and hopefully that will continue, but we can't control the revenue. We can't control the cost. All right, we're going to take one more question from Mariana Kellen before we move on. We're going to go back to uh, Terry, uh, Terry Roberts in just a moment. Uh, but we're getting a fair number of questions, and you can still send them in. Uh, we may stay on after the radio special ends at 3 o'clock. We haven't made a decision yet. Fairly flexible in the social media world. Mariana. So, yeah, we're getting lots of questions coming in, but Declan has a great one. It's really easy to get lost in the numbers and the yeah. revenues and yep. the debt and expenditures. But he says, could you sum it up for us compared to yesterday? Are ordinary people better off, no change, or worse off? How would you describe that for the average Ordinary person? People? Yeah, slightly better off because of the tax cut. Uh, but the gas but tax. The gas tax cut, but not any dramatic, no. This one, so if, if, if I could put it this way, last year was a panic budget. This was, oh my goodness, look at the mess, uh, oh boy. This one is kind of a reprieve. Um, so it's uh, a few twists, you know, a few um, elements being adjusted. And uh, some key things, that we, one of the things that really came out was that they did a, a zero base budget uh, analysis. Now a zero base budget means, sorry, let me-, let me Fine tooth this. comb? It's, well, it's not even that. It, it, so in the old days, they would take whatever the budget was last year, add on 10%, and that's you're going to be your budget this year. And for heaven's sake, make sure that you spend whatever money is in the budget, because if March 31st shows up and we still got money left, then we're going to lose that for the following year. So that was the mentality of the, the, pri the previous budget methodology. The zero base is show me every single dollar you're spending. On your telephone lines, how many telephone lines do you have? How many how many phones are in existence? Uh, how many long distance calls are you making? And and it is onerous and it's difficult. But uh, quite frankly, when I was listening to it, I was saying, well, uh, is this isn't that what the province, the people of the province, would expect anyway? Right. But that's not what the practice has been. Right. So so introducing that's the culture of spending. That is the culture of spending. About, right? that, yeah, that, yeah, that we're talking about. But this again harkens back to things such as. Um, Minister uh, Cody came out with a uh, discussion some time ago Shalom about- Cody, the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister yeah. of Natural Resources came out talking about farmland. That it took, if an individual said, I want that vacant piece of government property and I want to take it and turn it into a productive farm, it took five years. It took five years from the beginning to the end. Why? So the changes have gone in place, but you have to ask the question, well, what else is in, out there? What other uh, circumstances are there to make similar changes. And the, the people that really know are the civil servants, right? So on the one hand, you could say, we have uh, too, you know, too many civil servants and the like, but on the other hand, there's a talent pool there that really can make a significant change in this, in this uh, province, and that we need those brains, that gray matter of, of the, those civil servants to say, here's how we can really save and turn this province around. And, and to be fair to Minister Kathy Bennett, one of the things that she brought up was an example of highway construction. And she compared the building of, uh, the construction of 100 kilometers yep. of roads uh, the year before to now, and the minister's claiming that things have become much more efficient, that she could build almost 200 kilometers, I'm paraphrasing here, for the same price that it cost 100 kilometers last year, that they have found ways to make things more efficient. And I think, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, she is basically philosophically saying, we can avoid massive layoffs, and, and uh, we had uh, both Minister uh, Hagee yeah. and Parsons saying, we're going to be more efficient. We're going to do more with less, which we've heard over and over and over again, and uh, they're saying that's how we're going to make some of these savings and avoid some of the layoffs that, uh, that concern uh, Jerry Earl. All right, I want to bring the CBC's Terry Roberts uh, back into this because we talked a bit about oil earlier, and uh, Terry will be filing on oil tonight and its role in the budget on Here and Now. Make sure to catch that. First, though, get a sneak peek. Uh, Terry, welcome back. Hello, Anthony. You brought a graph. I have a graph. Show us that graph. All here. right, I'll hold up the graph. There's the graph. Right, That's we're talking oil production 
and royalties for the Newfoundland and Labrador government. We are, no doubt about it, hooked on oil. If you look at this graph, this says, uh, says it all right there. We're getting about, and Hibernia is the cash cow. It just keeps on giving. It's been producing for 20 years, and now because of all these upgrades, the extra exploration they've done out there, we're expecting Hibernia to continue producing for another 20 years. And Anthony, next year or the year after, we're expecting with $900 million in royalties from Hibernia alone. Well, you know, everybody knows that we're going to go from three to four producing oil fields right. by, the end, by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. Hebron, a massive project, costs about $14 billion just to sanction it. We don't know the final numbers, but we expect it's even more than that. That's going to be towed out uh, of Trinity Bay very right. soon. Good point. Going out to the Jean d'Arc Basin, going to start producing oil at the end of this year. The difference between Hebron and Hibernia is monumental in terms of what it's going to mean to the Treasury in this province. How so? Well, as I said, it costs a tremendous amount of money to develop it. Because of the arrangement we have with ExxonMobil and its partners, we're not going to get what you call super royalties or big royalties from Hebron until the project is paid off. Right. So within two to three years, Hebron is going to represent about half the oil production in Newfoundland and Labrador. Yet we're going to be getting a pittance in terms of royalties All right. because the companies, they need to pay off their project in the front end. So even though uh, uh, production at Hibernia is going down, our royalties are still going up at Hibernia because of the way the formula is worked out right. right now. But how long is that going to last? Well, if you look at this, uh, you know, by 2022 and 2023, uh, production at Hibernia is going to, you know, be about half of what it is this year. Right. But still, the royalties are going to be huge, uh, you know, $900 million again. So Hibernia is uh, so important to our treasury right now. And if you look down the road, maybe 15 to 20 years, Hebron will probably be doing the same. All right, Terry Roberts, appreciate that. You're welcome. That's the CBC's uh, Terry Roberts, and as I mentioned, make sure to tune into Here and Now tonight to get uh, Terry's report. He'll be focusing on a large part on uh, energy and oil and the role that oil has played in this budget. Uh, any comments about what you just heard from, from Terry? Um, oil is king. There's no, there's yeah. no question that that is the major driver, and although we've talked about things in the past such as uh, the fishery mm -hmm. and uh, the effect of that, uh, even with things such as the cod fishery coming back, let's say that uh, we did find that uh, uh, we, we got back to the level of the cod fishery prior to, uh, to when we just had to stop fishing, you still have a problem with where are you going to find the employees to, to actually uh, right. do the work. And even if you did that, it's, never, it's still not going to have the same impact um, on the economy as, as oil prices are. You're listening and watching a live special on Facebook and across CBC Radio right across Newfoundland and Labrador. We've only got about seven minutes left in the radio special. I'm assuming we're going to make a decision as to whether we're going to continue on Facebook Live or not in the next couple of minutes. I'll let you know as soon as I know. Uh, Peter Cowan, of course, was on earlier. He helped me uh, launch this special at uh, 2 o'clock island time, and Peter's back. Peter. Anthony, one thing that a lot of people pay attention to is health care. There were a lot of concerns going into today's budget that health care might see a lot of cuts. And so it's worth taking a look at the amount they're spending on health care. It's pretty much flat. Yeah. Now, in some ways, that you might think that's a good news. You know, they're not making any sort of big cuts. But health care spending has been going up at about 6% a year. So even just trying to keep it flat will mean they're going to have to find efficiencies in some areas right. in order to be able to spend in others. So some of the areas that they're spending... Uh, mental health, we saw the all-party com committee uh, report that came out that said that we need to spend more on mental health initiatives, so there's, uh, you know, some money in this budget in order to start implementing that. Mm -hmm. um, they've also got money to advance things like the Waterford Hospital replacement, you know, mostly that's in the sort of planning stages. Uh, they're going to keep going with the Cornerbrook Hospital and the long-term care facility there. But one thing that they made it clear was they're trying to make any of the nips and tucks at the sort of management behind the scenes level so that it doesn't impact services. Right. We heard from the health minister today though that they are doing the analysis and the problem is we're not getting enough value out of the money that we're spending on healthcare. So he has warned that down the road they'll be doing some analysis and they may say, you know what, this program that we've been doing, maybe it's dialysis in a community, yeah. maybe it's x-rays in another one. You know, look, we can't afford to spend the, this amount right. of money for as little return that we're getting on it. And I guess the analytical point there, Peter, is that uh, you can keep spending the same, but if inflation is inflation is inflation, then you're effectively losing the, the spending power and the buying power that you had. Yeah, it's everything else. The costs keep going up every year, and if you've only got the same amount of money, then all of a sudden you've got to spend more on everything from pens to the workers you're right. hiring to gas in your vehicles. 
and now that means you've got to cut somewhere else in order to just be able to keep the other services where they are. All right, Peter, thank you very much. You're welcome. That's the CBC's Peter Cowan, and Peter, of course, will be on tonight on Here and Now. Uh, check out more uh, full coverage. And uh, Debbie Cooper, Carolyn Stokes, they will guide you through a reprise of the news and uh, some aspects of the budget uh, that we've been talking about today. If you're just joining us and you missed that, uh, tune into Here and Now. And I should also mention, On the Go is devoting its entire show to the budget. Ted Blades was in the lockup, so On the Go today we'll have that thoroughly covered on CBC Radio right across the province. Only a few minutes left on the radio special. I should mention for you people who are watching us on Facebook, we are going to continue on Facebook live for another 15 minutes so three o'clock island time we're going to return to regular radio programming but we'll continue our budget coverage budget 2017 live from uh, here we are in the lobby of the confederation building where we've been for the last hour and the guy who's been helping guide us through the analysis of this budget is uh, larry short one of the things larry that some people seem to expect or were wondering if there might be some mention and there actually is has to do with transfer payments. Yes. Some people say, okay, let's look at Newfoundland right now, let's throw it some kind of SOS lifesaver. Yeah. And a lot of people think, and, and Premier Dwight Ball has said he wants to negotiate this, right. that transfer payments are the answer. It yeah. uh, doesn't seem to be the case. No, so the, the way the transfer payments work is it's based on revenue per citizen. So if, you, if you're in a province that has less government revenue coming in, per citizen than the average, then right. you qualify for transfer payments. In the province of Newfoundland, we have close to, if not the highest revenue per citizen of any province in Canada. So once again, we get back to the, that entire situation of, of spending right. and the potential then for equalization payments to bail us out of this is next to non-existent, so it just doesn't exist. All right, we're going to wind down our special layering and ask you for your final thoughts. If we go over it, we've got our notes here in front of us. We can sort of summarize some of that. we got about two minutes. Yeah, so really, uh, I want to touch on uh, something uh, in particular, and that was when uh, I was first asked to, to research this and, and get into the detail, I was surprised at um, how close we as a province were to, to uh, being downgraded and, and for uh, essentially to hit, us, hit the tipping point where we would really be in deep trouble. And I think one of the reasons why I was surprised is that there's such little debate happening about this issue and about many of the other issues here. We have a fundamental problem in this province that has to be addressed in the long run. Yeah. Uh, one of the potentials that, uh, whether it comes out today or some point in the future, is we need somebody with a great speech. The great speech is the one that comes out and says, I pl promise you nothing but uh, blood, sweat, toil, and tears, and here are the real changes that need to take well, place in this that's province. An issue, that's an issue of political leadership. I, I know, but part of the political leadership has been the, uh, has been, um, the fact that there is so much anger, there is so much bullying, and it is bullying when people stand up and start yelling at a minister in the government uh, to say, it's one thing to say I disagree with you, it's another thing to talk about the facts and, and offer suggestions. So, so it, you know, there are some great people out there that we would like to encourage to go into politics. And I know personally from talking to them, they won't because it's one thing to say I, I have a tough hide to get to the politics. It's another right. thing when they have personal attacks on them. So we should also have great debates about this, ask the questions. There's no such a thing as a silly question with these things. And, and uh, let's have a good conversation about let's it. Let's end on one quick political question. Sure. Obviously, there's certain parts in this budget that are going to be much more popular, uh, the gas tax being one of them. but. It's a bit like a torture victim saying it feels so good when they stop beating me, right? Mm. Because they did introduce this gas tax in the first place. Right. It, does, does Dwight Ball have a chance now to sort of put the flesh on the bones of the way forward and make his government as popular as they were when they first won? Well, again, I, I think last year's budget was a panic situation. Uh, this one is, has been a bit of a reprieve. We really need to see what next year looks like because that's where they have an opportunity to say, here is, this paints out exactly uh, where we're going to be going. There's going to be through right. the negotiations uh, with the unions, and here is the plan to say that regardless of what happens to the price of oil, here's uh, how you secure the future, not only just for the people of the province not and, and for okay. the employees, but for all of us. All right. Larry Short, uh, I want to thank you very much for your hey. assistance today. It's been a real pleasure. Appreciate that. Thank you. That's Larry Short. He's a chartered professional accountant with Hollis Wealth, and he's been uh, our analyst here in CBC's special coverage of Budget 2017. I'm Anthony Germain. I want to thank you for listening on radio and also remind you that we're going to continue on Facebook Live for, oh, the next uh, 15 minutes or so. So if you've got questions, keep those coming, and uh, we'll try to get to them just as soon as we can. Thank you so much for listening, and we're going to stay on Facebook Live.
call in, or rather, write in your questions on our Facebook page. We're also on the YouTube channel as well. And Ariana's been bringing your questions, some very excellent questions as well. So thank you for those. Yeah, great questions. So we have one from David Pippi, and this did come up in the budget lock-in. Could they be cutting the gas tax in preparation for a carbon tax? Yes, yes, it could. Mm. Uh, it, 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 the specific question was asked, and the answer was at the time, no, that there's still some negotiations that are undergo ongoing, uh, but there was not a definitive. Uh, so so the, the definitive answer right now is no, but is there a possibility? The answer is yes, depending on what the, the, how those negotiations do indeed work out. One of the ironies, too, uh, Ariana and Larry, is here you have an announcement of the cut in the gas tax of uh, eight cents, right? Yes. Starting Doesn't off. Starts on June 1st. That's right, yeah. And gas prices went up last night seven cents mm. for a net gain, Mr. Accountant, of <laughs> one, one cent, cent for now. Yeah. And we'll see exactly what happens with the price of gas uh, as it goes forward. Yeah. Are you yeah. going to keep going with questions? Yeah, we have Why tons not? of questions. But uh, just to get a sense of in this comment section, we're getting sure. tons of threads of comments. And I think people really worried sure. that they were going to be hit by some more fee increases. Yep. We know that that's not the case. Um, but, you know, and you can even tell right here in the lobby that things are pretty calm. Like this yeah. wasn't uh, a, it's as a you sunny day it, in sunny ways, I think. Yeah, it's not a panic budget. Yeah. Uh, the, the general conversation, people aren't angry, but they have a lot of questions about specific issues. Um, mm -hmm. So Tony says, why is the government so hated? Have they not made the necessary tough choices to reduce spending? Uh, so but the, they're hated for tax increases yeah. and fee increases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so all the respect to the ministers and, and, and to the premier, they're not necessarily the, the, the greatest orators that we've ever heard in the province. And, um, and to a large degree, uh, people just don't have an understanding of what is happening with the finances. That that when you throw these the large numbers like this at um, a group of people, and uh, it's very difficult to understand how does that affect them right. individually. So that's why often we've used things such as, based on $100, $66 is owed to the employees, the civil servants in the province of Newfoundland, so that you can understand that. Yeah. And, and I ask and I recommend to the government that they indeed um, uh, uh, communicate more and have that discussion, have that debate. Right. Um, with, it's, uh, it's an with interesting perception, though, sorry to interrupt you. It's an interesting perception, though, in the question that there has been some sort of level of profound cutting because a lot of people would disagree with that. You have a great analogy involving the Grand Canyon. Oh, yes. It's trying to pay off this, uh, this debt uh, effectively is like trying to throw a brick in the Grand Canyon. To fill uh, it. To fill it, you yeah. know, or try to bail out St. John's Harbor with a shovel. Um, so and this is this is um, this will get us through the winter. It'll get us through the next um, budget, but it doesn't address the long-term problems. Right. We have another question about our revenue. Brent says, right. uh, sorry, Keith says Brent is targeted or forecast at fifty-six dollars a barrel. Um, how much extra revenue will that bring in, or is or is 56? that a case where well, it wouldn't bring in much? Uh, so total revenue is about the same. I don't have to figure right. Where, or I, mean, I might, uh, but the the. The net revenue is about the same for uh, for where we were last year, I think. I think I can find it uh, if you give me a moment sure. to, to jot through. Um, Although it was, uh, I mean, it was a bit yeah. higher on the Yes, that's the right. So they were forecasting last year at $40 a barrel, uh, roughly $400 million, and now at $949 um, uh, million worth of revenue at $52. So it's going to take us through a billion bucks. Right. It takes about $1.1 billion as being total revenue. From right. oil. Right. From oil. One billion. Right. Uh, switching gears a little bit, getting a lot of specific questions about Labrador. How will Labrador be yeah. impacted? Um, and I guess I can touch on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, they are putting more money for the Trans-Labrador Highway. Again, one of those things we're, that we were talking about that always comes up in the budget. This is for the hard surfacing of right. the Trans-Labrador Highway. Um, and also they are um, adding some sheriff's officers to the courts in Happy Valley Goose Bay. They're hiring three new sheriff's officers and one court manager. So that was some specific things we're, coming right. out of Labrador, but very little uh, added or, true. or taken away. Yeah, really. Oftentimes I've noticed in previous budgets, there's a Labrador chapter that gets some attention. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really that the very Labrador little. section, I'm sure this is going to upset or not surprise most of the people in the big land, but it was not as though there was a Labrador chapter that really jumped out at you, unless, of course, you want to throw Muskrat Falls into there, and that really is more of a provincial right. story than a Labrador story, right? Right. Um, anything about insurance rates? Are they staying the same or going down? That question from Robert Woolridge. Insurance rates, that has to do with the taxes from the last tax year that were same. put on there? There's no new taxes. And that is uh, one area in which, and, and where Kathy Bennett certainly stayed to her word, she was emphatic, 
that she's been telling people since November, no new fees, no new taxes, and uh, this budget uh, bears that out. Yeah, another question, why can't Newfoundland borrow money from the Bank of Canada at a lower interest rate? Uh, it's not the purpose of the Bank of Canada to lend out money to the provinces. It, that's not their function. It's uh, the Bank of Canada is to maintain, without getting into detail, the short answer is that's not what the Bank of Canada does. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not their role. Yeah. Uh, so just a couple questions left. Uh, we have another question. Was there any mention of uh, approving the Salmon Project, the Greg Project in Placentia Bay? Not that I uh, saw. Not that I saw. No, I think that's a knowledge. political decision, not, not necessarily a budget decision. Yeah. But uh, that will come through with the regulations, I suspect. Yeah, and overall, people are just wondering how is this going to affect them day to day, and that's kind of the end of our questions there. But how how will this affect the average person? And as we spoke about, there's aside from the gas tax yep. being reduced, um, there's not a whole lot. Day to day, I think the big one is, is the gas tax, because yep. let's face it, we all fill up our vehicles. And I suspect per capita, Newfoundland Labrador has more F-150 pickup trucks than just about anywhere in the country. So for you guys and gals who are used to spending 150 bucks to fill up your tank, it'll be a bit cheaper come June. But that's really one of the few concrete lunch bucket, yep, that's how right. does this help me kind of things. Yeah, I, I guess you could say if they can keep their promise to stop electricity rates from doubling, right. they still might go up by 1.7, 1.8. Right. I suppose there is that hope that your electricity rates are not going to be as high as, uh, as a lot of people have said, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm Anthony Germain. That's as long as we're going to go on Facebook Live. Uh, Larry Short, want to thank you once again. My pleasure. And, uh, and Arianna Kellen, thank you very thank much. You. I want to thank the entire technical crew uh, for being here for us today. It's been a dynamite job on both radio and on Facebook Live and on our YouTube channel. And most importantly, of course, I want to thank you uh, for watching. And of course, there'll be more information about the budget tonight on Here and Now. Go to our website, which has many, many articles uh, that talks about uh, some aspects. A budget is like drinking water through a fire hose. You can't get through it all. And journalistically, one of the things that always happens is there's some nugget in the budget that won't become obvious until we let the fog of uh, finance sort of drift aside a bit so we can absorb all this. Here and now, we'll have uh, stuff for you tonight on television. And don't forget, on the go, Ted Blades and his team, they're devoting their entire show to Budget 2017. I'm Anthony Germain. Thanks a lot for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon.